testimonies from tough times. Ignore this funny uh, look on King David's face. I couldn't find, I couldn't find anything else. It, it distracted me. Did it distra is it sort of distracting to you? His, his little nose and this kind of funny looking mouth. I should have made Chris, I should have made Chris do an illustration for us. Um, but I, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make it uh, less visible as we get into the message this morning. But this was the most appropriate one. Um, so I'm going, I'm pointing it out because I know you noticed it, right? You looked at it, it looked funny to you, but we do want to turn to the word of the Lord this morning. Uh, and um, so this last message of our series from David is Testimonies from Tough Times, David and Difficulties. And so we're going to look at this, uh, we're going we're to turn this morning to the word of the Lord. It's our final message in the three-part series. If you missed either one or number two, we really invite you to, uh, to go back and uh, listen to it online because the three really, the three fit together and they build upon one another. And uh, what we're going to look at this morning covers the whole life of David. And we're going to look specifically at a, at a really high point and then at a really low point as well. And as we come to the Word of God this morning, um, I want you to think about David's life. David's life was a life we, as we know, of great blessing. He had a call from God to a very specific purpose, didn't he? He was called to be the king over Israel, over God's people. God had chosen them, not because they were great, not because they were wonderful, not because they were even very good, but they were small and in, insignificant and not powerful in the world's eyes. But God chose them as a people to be his very own. As an example, why? as an example for the whole world. And it's a reminder to you and to me that in the same way God has called us out of darkness. We weren't great and powerful. We weren't mighty. We weren't necessarily big in the world's eyes. But God said, I'm choosing you. I'm choosing you and I love you. And so David was called to be king over God's people. And as we know, he was the greatest king. We know that um, he was the greatest king until Jesus, uh, and his son Solomon was the second was the second greatest in in uh, in earthly terms. And so we look at the life of David this morning, and we see these great things. He was anointed. He was equipped. There were great victories in his life. He killed the giant uh, Goliath. But as we think about this this morning, I hope I have your attention. I know there's a lot going here. Let me. Let me see your eyes this morning, whatever else is going. Let me see your eyes. Okay. And I want to remind you this morning that in spite of all the victories, in spite of all the great stories that we know of David, that there was much in David's life that was a life of difficulty and hardship. And I want us to think about that for just a minute as the backdrop and as the focus this morning. Um, when we look at David's early life, there is no doubt that David was, as far as we know, the least favored son in his family. I talk with people, or I hear people at times, talk about favoritism in their families as children growing up. And some of you are looking at me right now with expressions on your face, because you experienced that yourself. And for me, from my background, that's so hard to understand. Our, my parents were so careful to, they, they loved each one of us, you know. But so many of you, um, you come from a background where perhaps you were not the favored child. Uh, somebody else in your family was, and there was unfair treatment. And perhaps there was even a, a, there was a difference in love or, or things like that. And that, that can be so hurtful, can't it, to, to a child growing up. It, it's, not, it's not right. Um, there's not an excuse for it. It's hard to understand, but it hurts. And as we look at the life of David, although the Bible doesn't say that specifically, I think it's very, very clear. David was not the favorite child in the family. There were others who for sure were much more favored than David. And that was part of his life, and that was part of shaping him. Even though God called him to great things, he was shaped in this way by what was going on in his family. Think of some other things in his life. He was misjudged. 
uh, he was assigned evil intent when in fact he was trying to do what is good? Has somebody ever misjudged your motives also and thought, well, you were trying to do something bad when what you wanted to do was something good? Uh, you've been untreated, David was treated unfairly, you've been treated unfairly. Uh, you, were li you were lied about in the same way that David was lied about. David was stabbed in his back by his own son and betrayed by his own son. And some of us have also been hurt and betrayed and stabbed in the back by family, by people that were very close to us. Uh, there were, he had broken relationships. Some of us deal with broken relationships as well. And there, David also made some very poor choices, and we haven't talked about that so much up to now, but he made some very poor choices in his life, especially later, and it really affected what happened in his family. And as we think about that this morning, without pointing fingers at any particular one, I could point fingers at everybody, including myself. We, too, have made poor choices at times, haven't we? Have you ever made a poor choice that, that perhaps you're still feeling the effects of at times or that you're still suffering from? All of us have. And so as we come this morning to this last message on David, what I want us to see is, as I've said before, I don't really care very much about Jewish, old Jewish history, ancient Jewish history, but what I do care about is what we can understand of God as we see how God treats uh, his beloved people, how we can understand our relationship with God as we see how David had a relationship with God. And what I want to say to you this morning is, you may feel, well, I am no David. Guess what? I'm no David either. Um, we perhaps have not been called to the great and mighty things that we think David was called to. But what I want to say to you is this. David's life experience mirrors our life experiences also, right? Right, and that's why we come to this this morning. And I believe, again this morning, that the Lord has a word of encouragement for us, a word of perhaps correction for us, and especially a word of restoration for us this morning, okay, and redemption for us this morning. And so we come, uh, you know, we come to this, 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 this last message this morning, and some of you remember, maybe now 10 or 15 years ago, I think it started in the U.S., but it became such a popular thing, uh, WWJD, right? And people wore bracelets. What would Jesus do, right? And I, I, I want you to think about it in a slightly different way this morning. What would David do? And then I think most of the time we could do likewise as well. And so uh, we are... Uh, we're going to come into the life of David this morning. Testimonies from tough times, David and difficulties. And what, I'm going to sh what we're going to look at this morning is that you and I can have testimonies from tough times. Even tough times from our past that are long gone, that are done with and that are over. And we think, God, there's no good thing from that. I have no positive memories of what happened in my life at this time. And what I want to show you this morning is all of us, just as David can have testimonies from tough times. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, uh, this, so we turn this morning to the word of the Lord in this last part, and we're going to start with uh, a story uh, in David's life that comes from 1 Samuel 27. So if you, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Um, and uh, we touched on this last week at the very end of the message, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of review so I'm not overwhelming you with scriptures this morning. If you need Chinese scriptures, but I think we don't need it, okay, we've got Chinese scriptures available as well. But I'm going to give you just a, a brief overview, and then we're going to come into the story. In this story, um, remember that two times David had the opportunity to take Saul's life. One was when he was hiding in the cave and Saul went into the cave. And the second time was when, and both times Saul was chasing after David to hunt him down and kill him. Okay? Uh, and both times David, uh, uh, Saul is given into David's hands and David could have killed Saul, but he chooses not to to take in his hands the judgment that the Lord will bring. Oh, what a lesson for us. And that's not even the main point this morning. So in this story this morning, it's the second time Saul is hunting after David, and uh, he and his camp and his, all his soldiers, I think it's two or 3,000 men, I think it's 3,000 men, they're all asleep in the camp, and the Lord allows them to sleep deeply. David goes into the camp, does not harm Saul, but takes his water jug and his uh, spear, 
from right by Saul's head, then takes it away, and then he calls out and he wakes them up. And he shows them the water jug and the spear to show Saul, I mean you no harm. I could have, but I didn't. And at that moment, Saul is filled with remorse. He's brokenhearted, and he says something like this, and it's in 1 Samuel 27. He says, okay, he cries tears, and he says, you're good, I'm bad. This is my translation. And he says, okay, come home, David. I will not try to harm you again. David rightly does not believe Saul's words because, in fact, Saul's heart has not changed. And that tells you something about uh, people and situations and ourselves at times. We can sometimes feel remorseful. We can sometimes cry tears, but our hearts haven't really changed. And until our hearts are changed, we continue in the same way, don't we? That's why God has to deal with our hearts, and that's why we have to let him. And that's why our hearts, uh, in God's hands, he can mold and he can make a difference. And until our hearts are changed, nothing else really changes in our lives. It didn't change in Saul's life. So Saul goes on home, and as we come into this story further, David says to himself, one day this man is going to kill me. So he leaves Jewish territory, and he goes into the territory of the Philistines. It must have been pretty bad for him to flee Israel and go into Philistine territory. So he goes into Philistine territory, and he goes into the territory of a Philistine king. This is kind of a mind blower, isn't it? It'd be hard to believe otherwise. He goes into the territory, and he goes to King Achish, who's a Philistine king, and he says, even though he'd killed a bunch of Philistines himself when he was in the, in, the Israeli, in the army of the Israelites, he says, King Achish, please, may I stay in this territory? And Achish, who is actually, he's good to David, but he has mixed motives. Achish thinks to himself, ha, if I have David as my subordinate, then um, Saul is his enemy. Saul is my, my enemy as well. Uh, I'm really going to be I'm really going to be sitting well. I'm si I'm going to be sitting pretty. And so Achish says, "Yes, David, you and your families can stay with us." And after a while, King Achish, uh, David says, uh, "King Achish, may we have a place where we can live with our families and that we can call our own." And so, King Achish gives David the city of ready for it. Ziklag, okay, Z-I-K-L-A-G, the city of Ziklag. So they live there for about a year, almost a year and a half. Now you say, wouldn't it be faster just to read it? I promise you it's faster this way. It's, it's a long passage. And so after living there for a while, all the Philistine kings are going to fight. And so they gather together, and King Achish says to David, David, you're a good warrior. I want you to join our forces. And so the Philistine kings march off to war with David and his men at the very end of the, uh, at the, very end of the, of the uh, army formation. They march for three days, three days, and all of a sudden, the Philistine army realizes, the other Philistine kings look back, and they realize wait a minute, look who's in our army. David is in our army. No, 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 no. We remember this guy. This guy used to kill us. And so they tell Achish, nope, send them home. If we get in a fight, King, uh, David and his men, they're going to turn around, they're going to attack us, and then, then we're all going to be defeated. And so Achish says to David, I'm so sorry, go home. You can't join us. They said they've already gone for three days. Okay, and so he's so David and his men, now we get to this part. So David and his men got up early in the morning and headed back into the land of the Philistines while the Philistine army went on to Jezreel. And then three days later, so they've traveled for six days straight, marching in difficult terrain, and now it's going to get bad. First of all, they're sent back from, from war. Um, they don't have the trust of these people, and now it's going to get much worse. Three days later, when David and his men arrived home at their town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites, always an enemy, uh, had made a raid into the Negev and Ziklag. They had crushed Ziklag and burned it to the ground. They had carried off the women and children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. It's pretty bad, isn't it, at this point? They'd carried off the women, oh, so we read that part, they'd carried off the women and children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. So when David and his men arrived at the town, they found it burned down. Their wives, sons, and daughters had been kidnapped. David and the troops with him wept loudly until they had no strength left 
to weep. Before we judge them too harshly and say, come on, be a man, What's, why all this crying? Remember with me, especially at a time like that, what would, be, what would likely happen to women who were captured at, in something like this. Think what would happen to young girls that would happen at a time like this. What would happen to young boys? All of these things. And so they thought of all these things. It's hard to get much worse than this, isn't it? Nothing good to say. And you already see, I hope you already see where I'm going. We have certainly had a lot of distractions this morning. Okay. Not only that, uh, David's two wives were also kidnapped. Now some of you may say this morning, what? Two wives? One is enough. I agree with you. One is enough. Um, and, Dave, and God was very clear about this, but anyhow, so he had two wives, and later he had more. Most kings had many, many more than that. It became part of a, this is how you had good relationships uh, with other countries, with other kings. They would give a daughter or a sister in marriage to somebody else that was powerful. And so uh, his wives were also captured. It can't get much worse than this. And I want you to see this because some of you this morning may be going through a circumstance, a situation right now where you think it can't get much worse than this. Or you're looking back at something in your life and as you look back you think to yourself, there's no good thing from that time in my life. There's no good thing from what happened. Well, you're right there with David, but it gets worse. Just when you, can't, just when you think it can't get any worse, it, ga it gets worse. David was in a difficult position and distressed in spirit because the troops talked about stoning him for they were all very bitter over the loss of their sons and daughters. So I want you to think about it. It just got even worse, right? Um, his enemies are against him. Everybody, the whole town, their, their whole home. Imagine if you went back home today and you had no home left and everybody that was at home, they were all gone as well, and they're taken, by, uh, they're taken by other armies. It can't get much worse than that. And then, the people that you think are your allies, the people that you think are loyal to you, now want to kill you. It's not just throwing a few stones, they want to kill them. How unrational, irrational, and unreasonable is that? It wasn't David's fault, but every, you know, let's find somebody to blame, it's not our fault. And so they turn to David. Now, we think it can't get worse, and for some of you this morning, you think it can't get worse than it is now or than it was in my life. What does David do at this point? There's a phrase that we're going to look at next that changes everything. It changes everything. Do you know what comes next? If you've got your Bibles, then you know what comes next. But let me show you what comes next. But David found strength in the Lord his God. But David found strength in the Lord his God. So I, I told you we were going to talk about testimonies from troubled, troubled times, and here's how we do it. This is how David did it. David found strength in the Lord his God. There was layer upon layer of trouble. There was no ray of hope. There was no way out. Now, listen to what David writes at another time. So David found strength in the Lord his God. There was nobody else. He couldn't turn to his wives. They weren't there. They'd been kidnapped. He couldn't turn to any children. They'd been kidnapped. He had no family members there. Anyone he could have counted on physically wanted to stone him or kill him. It can't get much worse. But David had God. And he found strength in the Lord his God. What I want to say to us this morning is this. However bad it has been, however bad it is now, you have one that you can always count on, and you and I can find strength in the Lord our God. In the Lord our God. Now look with me at something that David writes much later, and it's from Psalm 138. I love this. I want you to be encouraged because this morning uh, we're going to look at some of the Psalms of David because actually the Psalms, uh, David wrote about 73 of them, not all of them. There are 150 Psalms altogether and most Bible scholars believe he wrote about 73 of them and some of them are actually combined but they've been split over time. And David writes in Psalm 138, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. On the day I called you, you answered me. What comes next? 
my st shall we read that part together my strength of soul you increased isn't that encouraging so we go back to what just happened David found strength in the Lord his God and sometime later David writes these words and he says I on the day I called you you answered me my strength of soul you increased and then he says something else about his life though I walk in the midst of trouble trouble do, do some of you feel like you're walking in the midst of trouble this morning sure some of you do Look at what David says. You preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. And then look at what he says next. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work, the work of your hands. See, here was David. He was called to be king of Israel, but he was not yet king of Israel, was he? And here it seemed that his whole life was going to be cut short and that the purposes of God would not be worked out in his life. And I want you to understand that this morning, not just from the life of David, but in your own life. You and I get in situations that are hard for us, that are difficult for us, and it seems like there's no door open, it seems like there's no way ahead, and it seems like the things that God has put in our heart for our future, for our lives, it's not going to work out, it's not going to be, it can't be worked out now. This is the end of it. And what David says in this, it's this beautiful, beautiful picture, is this. It's trusting in the Lord. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Though it seemed everything was at an end, even in the midst of trouble, right? I'm walking in the midst of troubled times. He looks above the troubled, troubled times and he says, God, you will fulfill your purposes for me. Brothers and sisters, what I want to say to you this morning is this. God has put something in your heart. It's a God-given dream. We talked about this last week, right? The God-given dream, the God-given desire that God puts in our hearts. But we go through troubled times and it seems like, seems like it's not going to be, it's not going to happen. This is the end of it. But what God says to us this morning, as we see demonstrated in the life of David, is this. Trouble cannot stop what God's purpose is for your life. So don't give up. Look up instead of giving, giving up. God will fulfill these purposes. You can't make some of these things happen. God's going to have to make them happen. And then I love this. Look at this last part of verse 8. He says, do not forsake the work of your hands. And I love that. When we think about the work of God's hands, sometimes we think creation, right? We think, oh, there's this or there's that. May I tell you what the greatest work of God's hand is in this whole universe? You are the greatest work of God's hands. You are. You are His creation. You are His pride and joy. You are His glory. That's why He invests so much into you. That's why He says so much in His Word. And David understands that. And then he says, don't forsake the work of your hands. And in effect, God says, don't worry. I won't. I won't. God is committed to you and the purposes he has for you. He will not abandon you. He will not let you go. He's not going to let the trouble that the enemy brings your way thwart his plans for you. He's bigger than that. We sang this morning, how great is our God. And he's a great God. And he's greater than the trouble in your life. Now, what happens next? And I want to be careful about saying, now see, here's the prince, here's, you see, God did this and so God will do that, do that. I don't want to make that correlation, but I want you to see what David says of the Lord and we can learn something from what he says. So this terrible thing has happened to him and all of his men and then David does something and I want you to see this and I want you to be encouraged this morning. And David inquired of the Lord. So here he is in this trouble. David finds strength in the Lord, and then he inquires of the Lord. That's something we forget to do sometimes, isn't it, when we get in trouble. David inquired of the Lord, and he says, Shall I pursue? Shall I overtake them? And he, God, answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. Brothers and sisters, when you are in trouble, when it, when it seems there's no hope, there's no joy, there's no future, make sure, make sure you inquire of the Lord. God always has a plan. God always has another step. God always has a future for you. The devil wants you to believe this is it. This is the end. No hope. There's no future for me. Inquire of the Lord. 
and see what God has to say. And God will always, he will always make a way. It may not be in our time. It may not be in the way that we've thought, but God will always make a way. And so David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord told him what to do next. So they set off after them. They find them. If you read further in the story, we're not going to read further in the story, but we're just going to summarize. If you go that far, if you look in, your, in, in the uh, Bible and you want to read it later, what you'll find is this. They find the Amalekites. Nobody has been hurt. The Amalekites are celebrating a little too early. They're all spread out in a field, and apparently they're all drunk as well as they're celebrating. We have defeated... We've defeated our enemies. Look at all the spoils we've gotten. Look at all the prisoners of war we have. This is ours now. And so they're all drinking and partying out in a field. And David and his men come up upon them and beat them. And then what happens? Ah, be encouraged. Look at the next part. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken. And David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. David brought back all. Let these words resonate with you this morning. Let this truth resonate with you this morning. What does the Bible say about the enemy of your soul? The devil has come to do what? Steal, kill, destroy. That's always his, his work. If there's an area of your life that has been taken from you, if there's an area of loss and tragedy in your life, if there's an area of great pain in your life, if there's an area where there's hopelessness in your life, I can promise you it is the work of the enemy because he has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Let me tell you what God does in your life. When you inquire of Him and you walk in His steps and you walk in His way, rather than you and your life and your family becoming the spoils of the enemy, you will spoil the enemy's works. You will spoil the enemy's works. And David recovered all that had been taken from, from him. That is what Jesus did when he came to this earth, when he lived, when he died on the cross. He defeated death. He defeated hell. He defeated the enemy. And he broke the power of the enemy in our lives. There are things that still happen. There are things that we don't understand. We think, oh God, death is one day yet to be fully conquered in our lives. But eternally, we are with him. And what I want to say to you this morning is this. The devil cannot have your children. The devil cannot have your future unless you let him have it. Unless you let him have it. And I'm not pointing a finger and say, oh, be stronger. I don't mean it that way. But what I want to say is this. Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. And we see this beautiful example in the life of David. He inquired of the Lord and the Lord said, go after them. Go after them, you shall overtake them, and you shall get it back. David goes, and he recovers. I love these two phrases, and that's why I highlighted them. David inquired of the Lord, and David recovered all that. Not only that, because our God is a great God. Look at verse 20. David, not, he brought back all, and David also captured all the flocks and the herds. And the people drove the livestock before him, and they said, this is David's spoil. This is David's spoil. And here's this picture that in the Lord, in the Lord, you can not only recover what the enemy has taken from your life, but there will be, because he is God and he's a good God and he's a, a God of blessing, there will be more in your life. There will be greater in your life. And that's that picture that we see here. There's testimony out of that. You know, when this story started, we looked at what David, what was going on in David's life. Could there have been any testimony from that story? Any testimony? No. Home burnt down. Wives and children taken. All the flocks gone. Nothing left. Nothing left. But that's not the end of the story. And there's a testimony from tough times. There's a testimony from tough times. If you're going through something this morning, a tough time, I want you to be encouraged this morning. This is truth from God. This is truth from the Lord's Word. But I want to make another application as well. Because some of you this morning will say and will think and will feel, well, Pastor Jennifer, that helps me right now. But I look back in my life and there are things in my past that 
it's just a wasteland. There's nothing good from that. And I grieve over that. It's loss. It's gone. There's no good thing. I want to tell you a story this morning. I prayed about it. Lord, should I share it or not or whatever? And I felt, I, I feel that I should in relation to this about recovering. Um, you know, missionaries talk with other missionaries at times. And I was, I was talking with a, a missionary family one time uh, that, I knew, uh, that I knew very well. Not, not here in Hong Kong. And they talked about a very difficult time that they had gone through as a family. And um, the, the father, the, the man, they were married and, uh, and had, uh, they were married and the father, the man talked about a time he had gone through in his own life and he said in his own family uh, there, were, there were several children and he said it was very, very clear that there was only one favorite in the family and it was a child that had come along much later in life. Uh, the child that had been born last many years after all the others had been born and very clearly, this child was the favorite child. So it was really a source of pain for all of them. For all of them. And they were old enough, the older ones were old enough to see the favoritism. Um, and he said it was, it was very hard for them. And then he said, he said it got even harder when they found out that, the, the, that his mother had secretly uh, stolen inheritance, that their inheritance, had tricked the, the, the grandfather, so the, the mother and the father, they had tricked the, she had tricked her husband and had gotten the best of the inheritance, the largest part, and had given it to the last born, to the favored child. And then it got even worse when he found out that his own land and his own home she had worked, his mother had worked behind the scenes to even take that and give it to this favored child. Very, very difficult, very painful. And he said it was very hard for him because he looked at that and he thought, this is not even a mother's instinct. What mother would do that? Uh, how could a parent do that? And, and I'm telling you this, these details. You, you, will, you will never know who this person is um, until maybe heaven and then it won't matter anyhow. And he, he described as a Christian, as a missionary, trying to deal with these feelings of unfairness and, and ill treatment. And, and, I, and I share that because some of you still have these things in your life as well from your past. And then the time came uh, when the mom died. And he said as he went through that period, he said it was the hardest thing he'd ever gone through because all the old feelings came up, all the unfairness, all of the, the ill will, all of the favoritism, the stealing, the, the trickery, and things like that. I mean, it really sounds like the story of Jacob, doesn't it? Jacob and Esau and whatever. I mean, it, it was really, really awful. And he said as he went through that night, he said one night was particularly awful, and he said he, he, he just cried out to the Lord because it was so heavy and it was so hard because he was looking back, and there was nothing good. There was nothing good he could put his finger on about this. And he said he cried out to the Lord, and in the night hours, the Lord spoke to him and said, Honor your mother, because she gave birth to you. And because she gave birth to you, you have had the opportunity to know me as your God and to have a relationship with me. And he said, when the Lord spoke that to him, he said his heart was changed at that moment. And he was able to let go. He was able to forgive the ill treatment because he inquired of the Lord. And the Lord showed him there was something good from this. And God changed his heart. And God changed the family's heart. And there was something good that came out of it. And he was able to recover what the enemy had stolen, what had been a spoil of the enemy in his life, a broken relationship, God restored in his heart, even though the mother was gone at this point. But in his heart, there was peace, and he was able to let it go. And I've told you that story in detail, just to give you an example of what God, our faithful God, will do, what our faithful God can do. And I've told you these details not so you can say, well, who was it? You won't know. You don't know. But to show you that God can restore. 
and he can give you a testimony from tough times that you thought it's a write-off, it's wasted, there's no good from this. God can bring a testimony out of every tough time in your life if you will inquire of him and follow him. Amen? Amen. 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 You know, I, I look at David, and people always say, oh, David's so great, David's so this. But as I have studied David's life more and more, do you know what I see when I look at David's life? I think David had a really tough life. I really do. I look at David's life and I think, oh my, that, I wouldn't want that life. I, I really wouldn't. Uh, when you read through the Psalms, and believe me, I had pages and pages and pages. I'm not going to give you the pages and pages, but I pulled out just a few because I look at David's life and I think, well, it was a really terrible life. Um, but here are some of the testimonies from his tough times. From Psalm 59, uh, this is when Saul sent soldiers to watch David's house. This was after he'd married Michael. Remember that? We talked about that last week. Look at what David says, and we're not going to read it all. Um, but David wrote a testimony from that time. says, rescue me from these criminals. Save me from these murderers. Well, they were. My enemies come out at night, snarling like vicious dogs. But as for me, I will sing about your power. Each morning, I will sing with joy about your unfailing love. So though they came out at night, he was still there in the morning. I think David had a pretty tough life, but there came a testimony out of that, right? Here's another one. This is when he ran from Saul and went into the cave. Probably, uh, we don't know if this is the cave of Adullam or the other cave as well. Here's another testimony from tough times. Look at what it says. He says, have mercy on me, O God, have mercy. I look to you for protection. I will hide. I cry out to God most high, to God who will fulfill his purpose for me. There, there, you see that again? God's going to fulfill his purpose for you. He will send help from heaven to rescue me, disgracing those who hound me. God, my God will send forth his unfailing love and faithfulness. Here's another one. A psalm of David when the Ziphites came and said, we know where David is hiding. Remember we talked about this last time? He went to Keilah and helped them, the city of Keilah, and then the, Ke uh, the Keilites uh, betrayed him and said, we're, we're going we're gonna to let Saul know that he's here. Very next city he went to, same thing with the city of Ziph, and he, David had helped them as well, and instead they betrayed him, and what does he say? Come with great power, O God, and rescue me. Defend me. Listen to my prayer. Strangers are attacking me. They're trying to kill me. But God is my helper. The Lord keeps me alive. The Lord keeps me alive. And then one more. When David fled from his son Absalom. We're not even going to look at this one. This comes after he's king. And his own son grabs the throne, betrays him, steals the kingdom, and tries to kill his father. I think that's a bad life. I think that's a, don't you think that's a tough life? I think that's, it's, it's a soap opera. You're right. It's a soap opera. It really is. We wouldn't believe it if it were a Hollywood movie. But it was David's life. Look at what David says. Okay, testimonies from tough times. He says, oh Lord, I have so many enemies. There's so many against me. So many are saying, huh, God will never rescue him. Bunch of liars. I lay down and slept. And I, I wanted to include this because, you know, sometimes when we are in trouble and sometimes we're in calamitous times, rest, the enemy steals rest from our hearts, doesn't he? But what I want to say to you is this. Rest is your portion as a child of God. I want to say that this morning. Rest is your portion. And if rest is being robbed from you by the enemy, you go to God and you go to his word and you get it back. You get it back. The devil cannot have your sleep, and he cannot have your rest. You go to him. You go to him, and let, let him bring that back. And I know we go through times when there are physical reasons. I understand that as well. But overall, overall, rest is our portion. Rest is our portion. God says that in his word. And David says, I lay down and I slept, yet I woke up in safety. So we look at the life of David, and as I said, I had three, more than three pages full of all these examples of testimonies from tough times, and I think David had a really tough life. I really do, yet. Look at this testimony from Psalm 130, from Psalm 16. This is so beautiful. Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. 
Do you know why David could say that, though we look at his life and we think it was so, so terrible? We can say that, he could say that, because the Lord was his inheritance. The Lord was his portion. And what I want to say to you this morning is this. If you are struggling in this area, I invite you, I beseech you, go back to the Lord. Spend time with Him. Set your eyes on Him again and meditate upon who He is in your life. He is your portion. He is your inheritance. And our lives are blessed because of the Lord. He changes. He changes everything. Amen? Amen. So we've looked at this part of David's life, these blessings that come, but I want to look at one other thing in the few minutes that we have left this morning, and I want to touch on a sore topic this morning as we, and in, the, in, this last, uh, in this last section this morning, because some of us look at our lives, and instead of saying, yes, these things have happened to me, um, and it wasn't fair, some of us have trouble in our lives because of what we have done or because of what we have chosen. Yeah? All of us do. We've done something wrong. We have failed in an area. We've blown it as a parent. Um, or, or, or in our work, we really made a bad choice. All of us deal with this. And a lot of times we feel like, well, that's, I deserve that then. I deserve trouble because I really blew it. I deserve punishment because I didn't do what was right. There's no testimony from this because it's a bad thing. Do you know that David had the same thing in his life? You already know the story, don't you? We know the story. David was probably about 50 years old when it happened. We don't know exactly, but he was about 50. And I bring you, we, we close with this story this morning because um, all of us fit in this picture as well. We've all made choices that brought harm to our lives, and we thought there's nothing good out of this. David, instead of going to war in the spring, stayed in Jerusalem, and as he looked out over the city, he saw a beautiful woman who was bathing, and his heart was filled with lust, and he sent a messenger to find out, who is that woman? We know this story, don't we? Um, it's, in, it's in 2 Samuel 11, uh, or, or a little bit before that. And uh, then after he finds out that she is married, by the way, he then sends two other messengers uh, to bring her to the palace. And there they commit adultery. She goes back to her home. Her husband is a faithful warrior for David in the army at war, fighting the enemy where David should be. But David is back in Jerusalem. And in the course of time, Bathsheba discovers, I'm pregnant, and it's with David's child. And my husband is at war. So this is going to come out. And so she sends a message to David to let him know what has happened. David, at this point, if you think about, oh, what a terrible failing. It's failure all the way, isn't it? And it gets worse and worse and worse. David, instead of repenting, David, instead of saying, oh, God, forgive me, David, instead of coming clean, tries to cover up his sin by not murder at first, but by deceit and, and trickery, right? He brings Uriah, the husband, back from the army so that Uriah can be with his wife and then everybody will think, oh, it's Uriah's child. But that's not what happens. And Uriah is more honorable than David is. And in the end, David realizes, if I don't do something really drastic to cover up my sin, I'm going to be found out. And so he resorts to murder and Uriah dies in battle. And so we know, we know this story. So Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, uh, she, she mourns for her husband, and she mourns for him. And then when the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became one of his wives. Well, at this point, do you know how many wives David has at this point? Probably about eight at this point, if you count all the way through. And then she gave birth to a son. And so I want us to think about for that, that for just a minute, because I think at this point David thinks, I've gotten away with it. But surely people have to have an idea, right? He has sent messengers back and forth. Joab, the army commander, has to know something's up, because David said, let him die in battle. And Bathsheba's servants have to know something, because they know what has gone on. And so it must be almost an open secret at this time. But nobody does anything, because it's David. He's the, he's the honored king. He's the commander. And so David says he wants, he still apparently, he wants her anyhow, but also to cover his sin, he brings her to the palace, marries her, and then they have a child. And it seems like he's gotten away with it, right? 
And I, I say that because there are sometimes things in our lives that we think we've gotten away with. Uh, you know what Spurgeon said about this, the great, the great British uh, preacher, Charles Spurgeon? He said this, and I love this. Listen, God does not permit his children to sin successfully. Isn't that great? God does not permit his children to sin successfully. Aren't you glad that's true? Aren't you glad that's true? Because if it stays in our hearts, it's going to kill us. And so we look at this and then look at the rest, rest of this verse. But the Lord was displeased with what David had done. And, and the expression for that is he, it was evil in God's eyes. We never get away with it. We never get away with it. And God will not let us get, God won't let us get away with it. And aren't we glad? Aren't we glad? The Lord was displeased. We know, if you know your Bibles very well, you know that there is a psalm related to this event, right? How many of you know that? Yeah? What psalm? Psalm 51. So write it down if you didn't know that. Psalm 51 is David's psalm of repentance after this happened. Do you know that there's another psalm that's related to this? And you may not have put it together before, but it is from Psalm, it's psalm 32. So let me, look, let me show you what David says. And he didn't get away with it. And this is what was going on in the inside. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away and I groaned all day long. For day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. God doesn't let us get away with sin doesn't let us sin successfully. And David gives testimony to that. He says, it looks okay on the outside. This is what was going on on the inside. And honestly, brothers and sisters, any one of us, if we have ever struggled in this area, we know it's true, don't we? When there's this going on in our hearts, we just think, oh God, we come to church, praise the Lord. And in our hearts, oh, it's awful, isn't it? It's awful in our hearts. And aren't you glad it's awful? God does not let us sin successfully. Why? He wants to save us. He wants to save us. He wants us to prosper. And he knows that we won't. And so we look at that, just a reminder, Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is the one that we know so well. And here is David repenting after Nathan the prophet comes to him and says, you are the one, you sinned, you did that. And David immediately says what? It's true, I sinned against God, forgive me. Now, what I want to say to you is this. It looks like David got away really easily, right? Nathan says, you're the one. And David says, I repent. <laughs> Don't you wish it was really that easy? Now, the Bible is very clear. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But repentance should never be a light thing in our hearts. It should never it's serious. It's serious to God. And what is serious to God should be serious to us. And here's what we see in Psalm 51. It was serious to David as well. It was very, very serious. He says, forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves. And then he says, restore to me the joy of salvation. How many of you know when things are hidden in our hearts, we lose all joy? Yeah? We lose all joy. We really do make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach transgressors your way. That's what he does in Psalm 32. That's what he does in Psalm 32. And so he is forgiven. And then I want us to look at this. And you say, Why, how does this fit with the story as we, come to, as we come to a close this morning? David repents. The child is born. Uh, sorry, the child is born first. And then Nathan comes. David repents. And the child gets sick. Now, David has repented, but the child gets sick. And for seven days, David is on his face in fasting and prayer for the child to be healed, this child that was born from adultery. And the child dies. And I want you to read this because here's the, here's the encouragement. Right now you're saying, there's no encouragement, Pastor Jennifer. This is really terrible. Here's the encouragement. Stay with me. David hears that the child is, is dead. And then David got up from the ground, washed himself, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. Here's the testimony from tough times. Are you ready? The testimony from tough times is this. From Genesis to Revelation in the Word of God, every time there was washing of body, washing of clothes, putting on lotion, and changing into new clothes, it meant one thing. You ready? It meant 
it's a fresh start. It's a new beginning. You can start over. And you say, are you sure? I'm sure. If you want the verse references, I'll give you all of them. But not right now, because our time is, is coming to a close. But what I want to say to you is this. Whenever you read this, it symbolizes a fresh start and a new beginning. And here's what I want to say to you this morning, brothers and sisters. These things from your life that have been grieving your heart in the past, you think, it was awful, I blew it. Or maybe you're in the, in the process right now. Some of you are holding on to it. Some of you can't let it go. You're still feeling guilty. You still think, I was wrong, I was wrong, how could I, whatever. David felt that too. But in God, there's a fresh start. In God, there's a new beginning. And if you have been feeling, my life is messed up for forever, my life is twisted now because of this bad choice I have made, I say to you that in God, there's always a fresh start. In God, there's always a new beginning. David shows us this. This is Old Testament, brothers and sisters. This is under the law. How much more so in the New Testament under grace because of Jesus Christ? You may feel that, there's, that it, can't be, it, it won't be different. You may feel that it's twisted in your life. Or what, you may feel like, oh, I, can't, I, I will forever live with this burden. I will live, forever live with this guilt. And what I say to you this morning is this. <clears throat> God offers a fresh start and a new beginning. But you've got to clear it. You've got to open it up. You've got to do what David did. So if you need to bring something to the Lord, you don't have to go to somebody unless God says go to somebody. You make it clear with the Lord and just say, God, completely open it up. Don't just feel regretful. Don't just feel guilty. Repent and be forgiven. And be forgiven. That's the key. And then God gives you a fresh start. And look at what it says. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Some of you feel that your relationship with God is messed up because of the poor choices you have made. David proves otherwise. The relationship with the Lord can be restored. It must be restored. Don't let the enemy rob you of this. This is what he says when I kept silent. But then he says, oh, what joy for the one whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Yes, what joy for those who, whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. Remember what I told you? Psalm 32 is related to this event also. It's part of the same event. And then what does it say? I acknowledged my sin. I stopped trying to hide. And I said, I will confess. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. This is what the Lord does. This is what the Lord does. You can have a testimony from tough times, whether it was something that was done to you or it was something that you did, because our God is in the business of bringing testimony out of the hard things that we have been. Here's the Hollywood ending. You say, wow, is this the, here's the Hollywood ending. Are you ready? And you say, eh, I don't need that. Well, it gets even better, and I'll give it to you anyhow. Then David, after it's all over, he comforted Bathsheba, his wife. He slept with her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. Solomon. Now, you say, oh, that's a Hollywood ending. Oh, no, it's so much better than a Hollywood ending. And the Lord loved him. Why do I want us to see that as we come to a conclusion this morning? Because God doesn't hold a grudge. God doesn't say, yes, but you did this. This is a beautiful ending to this part of the story. And David loved him. Some of us think, oh, God, we think of God like ourselves. God holds a grudge. God's still thinking, yeah, but I know you did this. God's not like that. And God loved him. And the Lord loved him. And because the Lord loved him, he sent a message through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedediah. <laughs> Are you sure, God, you love this boy? <laughs> you want him named Jedediah? Do you know what Jedediah means? It means beloved of the Lord. It means beloved of the Lord. You know, we think Jedediah, yikes, what a name. But it means beloved of the Lord. There's some other verses, but it's time to stop, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to, am I gonna, am I gonna give you the other verses? Nope, I'm not gonna give any other verses. We're gonna end with that. So I want to encourage you this morning. I'm going to close in prayer this morning. I hope you've been encouraged as you see this. God can bring a testimony out of something you're going through right now or out of your past that you thought it's over and done with. Nothing good can ever come of that. And I've given you the example and I've given you God's word. God can also bring a testimony 
out of a place where you have failed greatly, greatly, and you think there's no testimony to be had, there's nothing good, I deserve God's judgment, I deserve God's punishment. Yes, we do, but Jesus took our punishment. And that is why we can have a fresh start and a new beginning. That's God's plan for you, beloved. Don't live with the guilt that the enemy puts on you. Don't, don't try to continue to cover up something that is ruining your life and destroying your peace. Let it go to God. He'll take it. He'll forgive you as you repent. He'll get rid of it. And he'll give you a fresh start in him. And you will have a testimony out of that tough time. Amen? Amen. Shall we pray this morning? You've been